that's perfect. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the Kessler Award Ceremony honoring Juana Maria Rodriguez. We're so pleased to have you here. This is our first in-person ceremony since um, the start of the pandemic. And so we are thrilled to welcome you back into the auditorium at the CUNY Graduate Center. CLAG's uh, office is here at the Graduate Center and our physical location is uh, located on the unceded land of the Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. And since we are also gathering virtually, um, we are live streaming this on our CLAG's YouTube channel. We recognize that many others may be on different territory. We invite you to learn about and take a moment tonight to acknowledge the history, present, and future of the land you currently occupy. CLAGS was founded in 1991 as the first university-based research center in the United States dedicated to the study of historical, cultural, and political issues of vital concern to LGBTQ individuals and communities. CLAGS nurtures cutting-edge scholarship organizes and co-sponsors events for examining and affirming LGBTQ lives, and fosters network building among academics, artists, activists, policymakers, and community members. I'm gonna turn it over to my co-chair of the CLAG's board of directors, James. Welcome, thank you so much for coming, really. Kessler is such an important sort of moment for CLAGS as a sort of institution. Uh, and it's an important moment for us to announce all the things that we're doing in the spring. Uh, so Kessler is amazing and we love it. And we're so excited to celebrate our awardee tonight. And we hope that you will join us in the spring where we are launching not one, but two new event series. Uh, so we have our Queer of Color, Trans of Color conversation series, which is gonna ask us to think deeply about what queer of color is as a field uh, and who are the sort of major names making moves in that space. And we've invited some really exciting people to just sort of come and share their work and think and talk with all of us. And we invite you to join us for those conversations. Alongside that, we are also launching a new series, Works in Progress, which is, as it might sound, a workshopping series. Uh, and where we're sort of inviting people to bring us their queer studies work and allow CLAGS to do the thing we were built to do, which is be an incubator for important cutting edge scholarship, to sort of nurture it, to find its home, to find its voice, and we're really, really hoping that you will join us for those projects. And so there's a bunch of different ways to get involved. Uh, you can donate, you can sort of like participate, and I'm sure that my co-chair will happily talk you through them. <laughs> yes. So uh, your support of CLAGS is essential to keeping our work free and public and um, vibrant to the community and to crossing um, across academic and public sectors. And so we invite you to donate tonight. If you are here in person, we have a table outside the auditorium with a donation box. You can drop cash in there. There's also a QR code that will take you to our website to make a donation there. And if you are watching this on the live stream at home, we will drop a link to our donation site in the chat. So whether your gift is $10 or $100, it has a significant impact on the lives of students and our community now and in the future. So again, I invite you to click, donate, drop that cash in the box um, and support CLAGS tonight. So now we're gonna turn it over to our CLAGS Executive Director, Dr. Justin Brown. Thank you, Laura and James. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to again to Kessler 2022. Annually, the Kessler Award serves as our most distinguished honor and is given to a scholar whose dedication and contributions to the field of queer LGBTQI plus studies has been pivotal landmarks on the landscape of the continual growth and expansion of the discipline. This is an award selected by the CLAGS board 
which reflects the high regard for which the honorees, colleagues, and peers hold them. Past recipients have included Dr. David Eng, Roderick Ferguson, Amber Hollibaugh, Gail Rubin, Cherry Maraga, along with one of tonight's testimonial speakers, Dr. Judith Butler. This evening, we will start with a few words from Dr. Rodriguez's friends, peers, and colleagues. Each testimonial will reflect on Dr. Rodriguez's work, contributions, scholarship, and also we will move then into the introduction of Dr. Rodriguez and her lecture for this evening. Immediately after we will have a moderated Q&A, conclude with closing remarks and the presentation of our award this evening. Additionally tonight, um, post for those that are here um, in recognition of our first event back also, we will have a reception in the atrium afterwards. However, before we begin, I would like to just take a brief moment of silence to celebrate the life and legacy of a foundational member of the field and the 2010 Kessler honoree that we lost too soon, Dr. Urvashi Bade. Thank you, everyone. And now we will begin this evening with our first testimonial speaker, Dr. Judith Butler. And just a few words about Dr. Butler as, he makes her way, as they make their way up. <laughs> Dr. Butler is the Maxine Elliott Professor Emeritus in the Department of Comparative Literature and the Program of Critical Theory at the University of California, Berkeley from 1993 to 2021. They received their PhD in philosophy from Yale University. They are the author of numerous books, articles, essays, and more, including some such as Trouble, Feminism, and the Subversion of Identity, Bodies That Matter, On the Discursive Limits of Sex, Powers of Violence and Mourning Precious Life, Frames of War, when the life is grievable. Their books have been translated into more than 27 languages and they have received 13 honorary degrees. They were from 2015 to 2020, a principal investigator of the Mellon Foundation grant that supports the International Consortium of Critical Theory Programs on whose board they now serve as co-chair. Butler is active in several human rights organizations, having served on the board of the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York and presently on the advisory board of Jewish Voice for Peace. They were the recipient of the Andrew Mellon Award for Distinguished Academic Achievement in the Humanities, were elected as a corresponding fellow of the British Academy in 2018 and to the American Academy Arts and Sciences in 2019. In 2020, they served as president of the Modern Language Association. Thank you, Dr. Butler. Please welcome. Um, it's a great pleasure um, to be here, uh, I think 21 years after my Kessler, uh, and um, to have the uh, chance with you to honor Irvish Yvad, who was my personal friend and um, who taught me how to be an activist uh, many, many years ago. <laughs> um, but it's my true pleasure to speak about Juana Maria Rodriguez this evening 
who is rightly being honored with the Kessler Prize. I've known Juana since she was a graduate student at UC Berkeley. And I'm pleased to say that I helped to super supervise her amazing dissertation. And it's with um, great pleasure that we are here now, some 26 years later, honoring you, Juana, you who have become, without a doubt, one of the most distinguished and original feminist and queer studies scholars in our time. From the moment you walked into the door of my office, I understood that I was the one who would be learning from you. Little did I know that we would become such good friends and that even then you would teach me about friendship, that mixture of support, accompaniment, laughter and sorrow that we've come to share over the last years. As you all probably know, throughout the Americas, Juana Maria Rodriguez is known for her startling and imaginative contributions to queer Latinidad, showing us how to think across the disciplines and demonstrating why we must think that way. In that first book, published in 2003, we encountered the vibrant intersections among feminism, performance, photography, law, social regulation, sexuality studies, race, and gender. In her research and her writing, there is always the question of where to find the joy and the pleasure, not because the sorrow is too hard to bear, but because joy and pleasure are one way of getting us through the sorrow, getting us through this hostile world. What few people know is that the same intensity that she brings to her scholarship, teaching, and friendships is also there in her service to the university in her avid and easy way of crossing several communities that the, that the university is supposed to serve. As a scholar, her work has shifted the paradigm in US queer and cultural studies. And that is surely one reason we are all here to celebrate her. But there is another reason, which is that she insists, insisted on the pleasure and power of performance, photography, of the everyday ways we make art out of the materials we have, we live on and make community among those whose queer search for kinship is open-ended and sometimes unpredictable. Her second book, Sexual Futures, Queer Gestures and Other Latina Longings, uh, garnered widespread praise and recognition quickly upon its publication. It is a brilliant moving book that works with several genres to consider the interrelationship between performance, sexuality, and law. Who does this? Whereas some scholars withdraw from cultural and political complexity into the methods and concepts they already have, the ones in, in which they were trained, Juana lets the material she finds reshape her thinking. Indeed, it is rare to see someone as eager to affirm cultural complexity and political commitment, but Juana Rodriguez performs those dual tasks exceedingly well. She discerns certain ideological tensions in the movement of narrative, the way people tell their stories, she brings together literary analysis, listening, social analysis, intervention. She considers the ways that social regulations institute categories that too often efface the complexity of lived experience, even as she finds within what seems to be a scene of effacement, possibilities for affirming life and desire. No matter what her topic, she provides multi-layered narratives and works in whatever media is available to her to provide an understanding of the intersectional dimensions of lives through an unsettling constellation of perspectives. Well, that was perhaps a long-winded way of simply saying that she's always trying to find the right way to get closer to other people's lives without imposing herself, to get closer to lives whose strands of existence don't always yield to narrative form. She is out there, and she is drawn to others who are out there. And what that means is that she's finding performance in everyday life in the response to legal regulations and the outrage that rightly responds to violence in the intimacies for which there is no ready vocabulary. 
Of course, yes, she's worked in English departments. She's bona fide literary scholar in women's studies and ethnic studies. But the fact is that she is beyond the disciplines. She works in an amazingly creative way across various media to show the relationship between how people come into the world and the aesthetic possibilities they discover to make their lives known. Her most recent work on photography makes this point graphic and vivid. Um, she effectively rewrites the theory of autobiography in light of political struggles and forms of self-representation that are hybrid, improvisational, moving across media and genre, amplifying ways of living and working for which there are no ready sociological categories. She's not opposed to the social sciences exactly. I believe she's in them right now. But she asks them to be more careful and attentive about the lives that they categorize and describe. She turns to the performer to find their language and lets herself be decentered by what she comes to understand about the life that is vitally present in performance, the life that survives in and through performance, where performance is hardly superficial or dispensable. What are those performances we, we require to live? That question, which I take to be one of her crucial questions, shows us that performance is no luxury, but rather a way of existing in the world where existing and surviving is not always guaranteed. When Juana Maria Rodriguez speaks about performance, she's not only talking about burlesque and drag, although she sometimes does precisely that, but also the embodied enactment of policy and law. So in addition to these nuanced analyses of deliberately queer performances, she offers deft considerations of sodomy laws and sovereignty struggles, all of which involve embodied enactments that navigate the distance between law and its enactment. She focuses on the interruptive potential of certain performances, how embodied gesture and radical political project can and do work together to contest dominant racial imaginaries and to produce a new horizon of possibility for the life of desire. As much as she makes the case for the political consequences of performance, she underscores the broad theoretical reach of performance studies as well. Juana Maria has a new book about to be published by Duke soon, yesterday, today, tomorrow. It relies on photograph, uh, photographic archives of sex workers in Mexico from the last century. Puta, <laughs> seeing Latinas, working sex. The work considers the range of biographical representations that make historically marginal subjects knowable to those who seek to reconstruct their lives. She considers the polytemporal problem opened up by using both photography and biography as modes of access to their past. She also considers the relationship between aging and racialized sexuality in this work, a theme less often considered in sexuality studies, but should be. This new work is, frankly, beautifully crafted, focusing on the illustrated life stories of sex workers, focusing on what the presentation of the face can offer as a way of soliciting recognition and establishing their lived historical realities. This impressive work contributes to new theories of photography, life story, image and narrative, the archive and the cultural history of Latina sex workers. At issue is not only how photos and stories may produce a testimony to a life on the margins, but how the testimony works against a political tendency to efface or degrade their, their very lives. Juana Maria's work is committed to understanding better how dignity can be found and affirmed among lives on the margin. And in this way, she brings heart into everything she does as she expands understanding and the capacity for work and life, for love and sorrow, and for those pleasures that emerge precisely when life is hardest, where one would least expect them. Juana Maria is a singular force, which does not mean that she is always on or never rests, but she does show up. And she's interested in all the ways that we show up for one another, despite the difficulty. 
Who else do you know who devised a handbook for how to have sex during the pandemic? This girl does not give up. I thank you, Clags, for honoring Juana Maria for her amazing work, for changing the way we think and live, for caring about our lives, and for making us alert to um, uh, what remains joyous and powerful in this world. I thank you, Juana, for your mind and heart, your enduring presence in my life. What luck, what a gift. Thank you again, Dr. Butler. Now we will hear from our second testimonial speaker, Dr. Nicole Fleetwood. Dr. Nicole R. Fleetwood is the inaugural James Weldon Johnson Professor of Media, Culture, and Communication in the Steinhardt School at New York University. A MacArthur Fellow, she is a writer, curator, and art critic whose interests are contemporary Black diasporic art and visual, visual culture, photography studies, art and public practice, performance studies, gender and feminist studies, Black cultural history, creative nonfiction, prison abolition, and carceral studies and poverty studies. She is the author, Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration, winner of the National Book Critics Award in Criticism, the John Hope Franklin Publication Prize of the American Studies Association, the Susan M. Glasscock Humanities Book Prize for Interdisciplinary Scholarship, and both the Charles Rufus Moray Book Award in Art History and the Frank Jewett Mather Award in Art Criticism. She is also the curator of the traveling exhibition, Marking Time, Art in the Era of Mass Incarceratio. When debuted at MoMA PS1 in September 2021 and ran April 5th, 2020, up 2020 to 2021, the exhibition was listed as one of the most important art moments in 2020 by the New York Times and among the best shows of the year by the New Yorker and hyperallergic. Welcome, Dr. Fleet. Good evening. It's so wonderful to be here. Um, I kept asking if there were tissues up here for Juana, but they're really for me. Juana knows that. <laughs> you know, and I was sitting there next to Juana and I was thinking, how do I theorize a friendship that brings down, that calms my nervous system? Whenever I see Juana, whenever I sit next to Juana, my nervous system calms. Like Juana's smile is magic. It is magic. And it has had that effect on me since I met her in 2003. But let me just back up and say, thank you, Clags, because I'm jumping in because I, before the tears come. Um, but thank you, Clags. This, you made an amazing choice. Every choice is a great choice, but thank you for this opportunity to talk about my soul friend. Um, and it's also such a joy to be here with Dr. Emma Perez and Dr. Judith Butler. So thank you all. And I feel like we're friends because we're friends because of Juana's friendship. Um, but Juana is the best femme friend a girl could ask for. I have nothing academic to say tonight. <laughs> Juana and I met in 2003. We were new hires at UC Davis. It was my first tenure track job. It was a challenging position for me. Um, I wasn't sure if it was a good fit. I felt alienated, but I was going to make it work. And I remember sitting in my office, hunkering down, the door was open, and I looked out, and there was Juana and baby Mateo standing in the hallway, just smiling at me. And we've been friends since then, since 2003. 
during our time at Davis together, um, we organized a reading group that included um, Gayatri Gopana, Beth, Beth Freeman, and some other uh, colleagues who were at UC Davis. And it was through that reading group that I learned that my, I lean into people like Juana out of a sensibility. It's a sensibility that Juana is my simpatica. Like we just, our friendship is, um, is soulful. It's a soulful friendship. And I've seen Juana bring that soulfulness into like her interactions in the classroom. She, she spoke in my class. I've seen her do it at conferences with taking parenting Mateo. I tend to make everything hard. Wanda tends to make everything easy. <laughs> and, it's like, and I've learned so much from that kind of grace and that smile that she just brings to every situation. In 2005, um, I had a, a, my a child, my son Kai, and um, because of, and I was living in New York at the time, but because of some bureaucratic reasons, I had to go back to California and be in residence at Davis for a month. And we, Kai was five weeks old. I was struggling with postpartum anxiety, not knowing that that's what I was dealing with. And we lived with Juana and Mateo and, and um, they took care of us for a month. And it was it really was what we needed in order for, for me to be able to bond with my son. And um, and I knew at that moment, I didn't just have a soul friend. I had a, a family member that, you know, that Juana is family and that being with Juana feels like home. Um, I know that I can drop in anytime, anywhere. And we're going to pick it up. And the very first thing we're going to ask each other is, who are we sleeping with now? And that's going to take up most of our conversation. That could go on for 10 minutes or two hours. That is always the very first thing we talk about. <laughs> and usually it's a very juicy conversation, right, Juan? <laughs> um, but we have shared work with each other. Um, she, Juan is such a generous, rigorous reader. Um, but what inspires me most is how creative she is. And like Juana takes an inkling, like she's like, I'm kind of thinking about this thing, or I heard about this like retirement home for sex workers in Mexico City, or like just something, right? And then like you're like, okay, tell me more. And before you know, like she's created some kind of majestic, rigorous, amazing work that not only is transformative to the field, but it also transforms her. I see Juana change through her research, that Juana fully embodies what she's doing. And I don't mean she takes on other people's lives or personas, but she, all of her goes into her work in, in this really, really, really powerful way. Um, but I do want to say that you are, Juana, the, one of the most creative, inspiring, imaginative, expansive thinkers I know. And it shows up in your writing. Um, I love, Juana, that I can share whatever with you. My joys, my desires, my hopes, my heartbreaks, my losses. I can share it all. And you know what you always say? I hope you hear it. It's all good. <laughs> Juana, it's all good. <laughs> um, I also want to say that I've had many opportunities to talk to students and people you've mentored and and everyone, it's like, it's an energetic thing where everyone shares the smile, right? They're like, it's what you do is magical. Your relationship with people is magical, that it is heady and it's also embodied. And it's, it's just that special combination. Um, students love her openness. They love how she discloses in a way that's not oversharing. Um, and uh, how she embraces fantasy life. I mean, because of Juana, I believe that my my fantasy life is so much more interesting as well as my just whole erotic world. Um, and I know that I'm a better person because of our friendship. Um, I know that I am learning to be more expansive, more open um, because of your model of femme freedom. Um, and what I love most about you, Juana, is how you love. It is a fleshy, embodied, joyous, ecstatic experience of being loved by you. Thank you, dear friend.
Thank you so much for those words, Dr. Fleetwood. And now for our final testimonial speaker, Dr. Emma Perez. Dr. Perez is a research social scientist at the University of Arizona's Southwest Center, as well as professor in the Department of Gender and Women's Studies. Perez has published fiction essays in the history monograph, The Decolonial Imaginary, Writing Chicanas into History. Her first novel, Golf Dreams, was published in 1996 and is considered one of the first Ch um, Chicanx queer lesbian novels in print. Her second novel, Forgetting the Alamo, Our Blood Memory, earned awards including the Isherwood Writing Grant, second place in historical fiction for the International Latino Book Awards, and general fiction finalist for Landa Literary, Literary Foundation. Her novel, Electra's Complex, is an academic mystery with a queer Chicanx history professor as protagonist. Previously published essays and poems are forthcoming in a collection titled Queering the Border and a dystopic novella, Chronicle of a Shifter, detailing the lives of rebels resisting a cor corporate or corrupt, sorry, global world order which will be coming in 2023. Without further ado, Dr. Perez. Such an honor to be here. Such an honor to follow um, Dr. Judith Butler and Dr. Fleetwood. A little intimidating, but I think I'll I'll do my best. And oh my God, so happy to be here for Juana Maria Rodriguez. And you know, I'd like to begin with a story about um, the time that Juana Maria Rodriguez broke my heart. <laughs> but um, I'd be wrong for two reasons. First of all, I'd neglect to begin at the beginning that is when we first met. And secondly, the story about breaking my heart would be a lie because this cutting edge, sexy Latinx, bisexual, queer, accomplished scholar, Juana Maria Rodriguez is not a heartbreaker. She's a heart mender. She's a custodian of the disheartened and dejected, a creator of foundational communities, queer and otherwise, architect of black, brown, indigenous, qu white, queer, trans familias of intimate friendships. Whether ex-lovers or not, whether fucking or having fucked or, fu or not, her allegiance to intimate friendship is paramount. And she steadily reminds us that a broken heart and the risks to live our lives out loud are worth the betrayals, they're worth the trespasses and the losses because we can find solace with each other, our queer trans familias. So let me back up as promised. Here's the thing, neither of us remember our first meeting, but we have evidence of such an encounter because she found a signed copy of my first novel with something like, to Juana, suerte con tus estudios. So we assumed she attended the book signing in Norma Larcón's UC Berkeley class. Personally, I think she sent someone with the book and I signed it, I signed the copy because I don't think I would have forgotten her. Now the memorable first time that we met was at um, the National Women's Studies Association Conference that was held in Denver in 2010. So Juana Maria approached me, she stood directly in front of me and she said, introduced herself and she said, um, I thought you were bigger. So my response was, I am big. And so began our flirtation in the corridors of academe. So I followed her career, looking forward to her publication, uh, to her publications, which were unswervingly daring. They were fresh, queerly sexy. Her first book, Queer Latinidad, has this stunning image of a ripe, bared open, sumptuous papaya on its cover. 
Now it illustrates the many forms of Latinidad via queerness in various discursive spaces like the chat room, the bar, the street corner, the computer screen. So she surmises that identity is not static, not uniform, and not without its contradictions. In Rodriguez's words, my experience does not authenticate me. Yet I do speak about others, clear in the knowledge that I am not speaking for them, that even if I give their words space, they are framed through a text of my creation, not of my own. Still, I continue to interpret and write, always through the traces of other whispers and silences. So the whispers and silences to which she refers continue to lure me to her. And I do mean her scholarly works. And I assigned um, her books in my graduate classes, classes in which graduate students became big fans of Juana Maria Rodriguez. So I also must admit that in those early days, I developed a steadfast intellectual crush when I assigned her second book, Sexual Futures, Queer Gestures and Other Latina Longings. And as I uh, confess to close friends, talk about Latina longings, the book does satisfy. So we are urged in that book to imagine another kind of sexual future, one of utopian longings, one that incites and submits willingly to consensual playful couplings like quote, butch and fam, top and bottom, husband and wife, master and slave, sugar daddy and baby boy, or any other form of sexualized corporate performance. And yet the scholar activist does not idealize these corporal arrangements. After all history, um, I would say history disrupts and assigns meaning to our fantasies, right? And she says a colonial wound can work against the grain of desire. But Rodriguez is not one to give up easily on fantasy, on erotic, on erotic or otherwise, right? By taking us to that queer bar, to the dance floor, to the spaces that besiege us, um, these unmitigated forms of expression and freedom, she reminds us about the beauty of day-to-day -day life among each other, with and among each other in, a, in this queer transfamilia. Look for pleasure, she commands, in dance, in sex, in touch, in the warm sweetness of a ripe fig against our lips. We reach for the touch of joy, and as it brushes past, we are reminded of the gap between our psychic lives as sexual subjects and our lived experience as desiring carnal bodies living in the belly of a hostile world. So with words and sentiments like that, Throughout her text, how could I not feel anything but an undying intellectual crush? So this is all to say that before we actually dated, and we did date, once upon a time, I did my homework before we dated. I read her assigned books. I read her books, I assigned them. I developed that ubiquitous intellectual infatuation that we're all familiar with in our profession, right? And subsequently felt prepared for our first date. And it was fun. I won't say more. Okay, maybe I'll say a little bit more. In our first two months of formal dates, which happened in either Tucson or Berkeley, because I was living in Tucson, I still live in Tucson, I learned how much I truly liked this human being who is devoted to her friends, devoted to her kin, her son, her co parent, her mentors and mentees, devoted to her scholarship devoted to her poetic activist gestures and devoted to herself. I was enamored with a lovely, brilliant, sensuous, witty, vivacious Latina femme who I felt should remain in my life. And somehow we decided mutually that we value our intimate friendship that would permit us to sustain crazy queer adventures as writing partners and academic booze who enjoy travels to cities and places that renew us, whether we're on the beaches of Hawaii, the deserts of Tucson, museums of San Francisco, sex clubs of Berlin, those are particularly fun. Um, I won't say more. Um, or the streets of New York City. And we decided mutually, but okay, I'll, I'll, let me be a little bit more honest. I'm a kind of a dark Scorpio who's somewhat possessive and jealous in that Latina butch kind of way. It never would have worked. <laughs> Friendship definitely works. So I think it's also important to note how much this scholar activist, Juana Maria Rodriguez has contributed 
her time to queer trans Latinx groups and community organizations in New York, San Francisco, and even Puerto Rico in the late 80s and into the 90s, she helped found some of the early Latina lesbian lesbian networks that are associated with, for example, Encuentro de Lesbianas Feministas de América Latina y del Caribe, as well as the collective core of Ellas en Acción. She became involved with the Proyecto Contra Sida por Vida as volunteer and supporter of HIV prevention in the Latinx Bay communities. So I mentioned these I mentioned these activities because they speak to Juana Maria's enduring commitment to things that matter in our academic lives. Because for queer trans Latinx folks, there is no division between our academic jobs and our personal lives. And I believe this to be true for most queer trans scholars who take from lived experiences and translate those daily into scholarly works with hope of changing a violent world where queer and trans folks are gunned down even in our hallowed gay bars. So as my writing boo, I consistently feel she supports me even through lonely days of self-doubt, self self-abuse and treachery of my own making. Riding with her feels like living inside a Pedro Almodovar film with vibrant colors, primary hues of red, yellow, orange, all bright and shiny, even when tragedy strikes and becomes comical because we're forced to recognize how much we entertain and indulge self-importance, or at least I'm forced to do that. So instead of drama that could be a deep dive, we offer up wake up calls and tell each other, your chapter's great, you chose the right word. Uh, that's the best name, that's the favorite adjective. So I feel really fortunate that I've had a front row seat while she drafted her latest book, Buta Life. And I believe it was, it was probably the first spring of COVID, nightmare virus COVID, right? That she called me on the phone and said, okay, let's write the fuck out of our books because we can't do anything else. And I said, fuck yeah, let's do it. So while we were, ex she was exposing bodies as desiring se se sexual subjects and desired sexual objects, I was formulating this dystopic future in which brown and black sex gender shifters are held captive in detention centers. So my work, not, not so sexy, I know, but fiction takes you where it takes you. So um, the fact is, though, we were very disciplined, even through unstable COVID days when the writing lagged and motivation was elsewhere. And I do believe we stayed on track because our, um, our early 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. text and phone calls urging each other to get the damn thing done. And we did. We got it done. Duke publication next year, 2000, 2023, Puta Life will make its debut. So I want to leave you with a few passages from her prose poem by Juana Maria herself. The prose frames in her words, the pleasures, the crescendos and erotica of puta life. The memory and a sense of this, of this poem, sort of of this poem transcribes her, it's, it's as if it foreshadows her forthcoming book. And it's called Brujeria, the queer karaoke remix by JMR. Published in 2015. Yo era una joven mocosa when I first entered the world of queer club spaces at 14, but I swore I was the bomb. With my payless high heels and puta red lipisticky, I had no problem entering the warehouse, the mafia controlled gay bar in my hometown of Hartford, Connecticut. It was 1974, at a time when the legal drinking age was 18, and no one cared what perverts did in our dirty little corner of a dying city. The warehouse was a huge mirrored space that smelled of popper sweat and the stench of last night's beer bust, a club where all things of drug and culo were brought and traded in bathrooms and nearby alleys, full of black folks and other, other Puerto Ricans. We were all Spanish then. And it was the place where prostitutes took their johns, where preachers danced with their choir boys, with their boys from the choir, where anyone could go to be escandaloso and invisible all at once. Brujeria. We had the santos, the orishas, the brujos all on our side. And the warehouse was our place of worship, a magical sensory overload, a huge enveloping colorful closet queer before queer was queer. And we went to church every night down on our knees, head thrown back, mouths wide open, ready to receive communion, papi. 
We sacrifice tequila sunrises, Newports and chicken bones on the daily to make sure our prayers were heard. Our magic lasted all night long. It followed us from the dance floor to grind Vien Sucio up against the wall. It was the smell that stuck to sticky fingers, the lipstick stains that shout could never shout out, the blister that formed on your pinky toe and burned like hell, ready to pop if you kept on dancing. But we did dance and fuck and pray and party, working the only magic we had, asking Brujeria to make un mundo nuevo, just for us. So thank you, Clags, for giving me the opportunity to honor Kessler awardee, Juana Maria Rodriguez. Te quiero un chingo, amor. Thank you, Dr. Perez. And now, without further ado, I just want to take a few moments to introduce our 2022 Kessler honoree, Dr. Juana Maria Rodriguez. Dr. Rodriguez is Professor of Ethnic Studies and Gender and Women's Studies and Performance Studies at UC Berkeley. A graduate of the Ethnic Studies PhD program at Berkeley, her research focuses on racialized sexuality and gender, affect and aesthetics, queer of color theory and activism, technology and media arts, law and critical race theory, and Latinx and Caribbean literatures and cultures. Professor Rodriguez is the author, as you know, of Queer Latinidad, Identity Practices, Discursive Spaces, Sexual Futures, Queer Gestures and Other Latina Longings, which won the Alan Bray Memorial Book Prize at the Modern Language Association and was a Lambda Literary Foundation finalist for LGBT studies and served as co-editor of the special issue of TSQ, Transgender Studies Quarterly on Trans Studies in Las Americas. In 2021, she was the John P. Berkland Fellow in the Humanities at the American Academy in Berlin, where she did complete that third monograph, which we all are looking forward to, Puta Life. Now, without further ado, for our main event, Dr. Rodriguez. It's hard to prepare for this. No one's sort of, I have the tissue. Um, oh, my thanks to the Clags board for selecting me for this extraordinary honor. Special thanks to Laura and James, the co-chairs. My thanks to the Clags staff, especially Justin, Donna, Jasmina, and all of the interns that worked on this event. Um, I am beyond moved by the, the testimonials offered, and I thank my testimonial speakers for their kind words and mostly for being extraordinary friends. Finally, I want to thank all of you for coming. The community of scholars, artists, activists, and students that have accompanied me over the course of my career have become my extended family. And it means the world to me that you showed up here and virtually believing that I might have something interesting to say. I am humbled beyond words. For a while now, it seems, I've been thinking and writing about sex, about the sweet stickiness of it, about the fantasies and traumas that fuel it, about the laws and regulatory structures that try to suppress it, and about the queer communities of care that continually activate it with new meanings. My first book, Queer Latinidad, explored the spaces of HIV activism and law, but also my online escapades in internet chat rooms. 
sexual futures invited readers to consider the ways power, pleasure, and authority circulate on dance floors, play spaces, and public policy. And my third book takes up the affects and aesthetics that define sexual labor. That book, Buta Life, Seeing Latinas Working Sex, is scheduled for release in April. Thank you, Duke University Press. Now, yes, <laughs> for the uninitiated, the word puta can be translated as whore, bitch, slut, and sometimes it's used to simply mean woman. But honestly, you already know this. The Spanish word puta needs no translation, like the word macho, that other term for excessive Latinized gender. Puta has already secured a spot in Merriam Webster's English language dictionary. In this new project, I engage the visual tropes that surround puta life to consider the small and also spectacular ways that we see sexuality and assign it meaning. In it, I probe the stigma that surrounds sex work by homing in on the ways sexual labor becomes a visual phenomenon one that trains viewers to identify aberrant sexuality and render judgment. I argue that as feminized subjects, we exist under the punishing gaze of visual regimes that determine our right to protection and care based on how we look, who we fuck, and what we refuse. And while I could be sharing the beautiful archive of photographs that I assembled for that project, I'm instead going to spend my time tonight talking about why you should care about sex workers and the ongoing criminalization of their labor. But first, as has become my habit, I'm going to overshare just a little bit. In his posthumous text, The Sense of Brown, our querida Jose Esteban Munoz, whose presence surrounds this moment, reminds us from the other side that, quote, our affect does not simply flow out of us, but instead tells a story about our relationality to ourselves and also to groups. So, I want to tell you a story about my own relationship to puta life. Like so many other feminized subjects, by the time I was a teenager, I had already been warned about not dressing like a puta by my mother, hailed as a spick slut by my schoolmates, ogled, pinched, groped, and treated as an object for somebody else's pleasure by the adult men around me. In other words, I had already been assigned the category of puta by the world and only had to decide my relationship to it. I came into sexuality in a moment after women's liberation and before AIDS, a time of sexual adventure and risk-taking. Pornography was my guide, bisexuality my default position, and the gay bar my university. I do say the warehouse, the gay disco in my hometown of Hartford, was queer before queer was queer. Located on the outskirts of straight life and all that it implicated, it was a multi-generational, multi-gendered space that was Black and brown and queer all over. Walking into the warehouse night after night, I knew that I was leaving something behind, but also entering a magical queer world of possibility, a way of living otherwise that would forever change me. Queer sex saved my life. It challenged everything I knew about the way the world was ordered, the kinds of bodily pleasures that were possible, and the social relations that sexual connection could engender. Many of the dykes that I met at the warehouse worked the massage parlors and strip clubs around Hartford. Occasionally, these women would bring their johns to the queer club to party in our underworld playground, fueled by desire. 
disco and the dark. Some of these women became my friends, others would become my lovers in the lust and drug-fueled parties that seem to happen every weekend. It really is a wonder that I graduated high school. I did. Um, part of that queer initiation process was a visit to the local sex shop. In a time before you could buy sex toys online, before streaming porn and internet chat rooms, local sex shops with the neon XXX in the window were where you went to buy dildos, poppers, and smut. Um, the dildos of that time were these kind of hard plastic things, literally with like, I do not recommend. Um, Walking into these stores with the windows blacked out to protect the identities of those inside served to remind you of all of the ways you were bound with those marked as lowlifes, perverts, queers, and freaks by dominant society. These early lessons in sexual communities and the sexual politics that emerged around them fueled my interest in those who got paid to have sex. As a young person already engaged in illicit and illegal sexual encounters, that is underage sex with friends and strangers, sometimes for drinks or drugs, sometimes for a place to crash, and usually just for the thrill of it. I quickly learned that my sexuality had a value that could be traded. The summer before my senior year in high school, I was trying to save money for a road trip with my older butch lover, and I began to consider sex work as a fast cash option to supplement my savings from my minimum wage job. Several of my friends from high school had already discovered that they could earn quick money giving blowjobs to the men who frequented the train station in downtown Hartford. At $25 a blowjob, I wasn't sure the hassle and the risk were worth the money. As a teenager, I already had a lousy job I hated. As luck would have it, that summer I was solicited to engage in another kind of sex work a kind of sexual labor that I would keep returning to throughout my life. I got paid to talk about sex. After seeing more than a few of my friends drop out of high school because of pregnancy or suffer through the ordeal of securing abortion, legal but still expensive, I started taking my classmates to the local Planned Parenthood clinic. I was their number one recruiter. That summer, Planned Parenthood offered me $150 to talk to parents and social workers about the sex I was having as a bisexual Latina teenager, my first speaking gig, right? I jumped at the chance. As a sexually audacious and politically empowered proto-feminist, I had expected that my first encounter selling my sexuality for cold hard cash would leave me feeling empowered and liberated. But I admit, after two hours of recounting my sexual adventures to aghast parents, troubled uh, social workers, and concerned health providers, I went home feeling dirty and ashamed. That said, the money was good. Um, Moving to San Francisco in the mid 1980s in the midst of the AIDS pandemic made talking explicitly about the sex we were having and the sex we were wanting to have a matter of life and death. Having already produced and exchanged dozens of dirty Polaroids with friends and lovers and friends of lovers, when I was asked to pose for the raunchy and celebrated lesbian erotic publication On Our Backs, I was more than eager to sign on. During this time and before and during graduate school, I published an SM themed short story. I led sex positive workshops for Latinas for Proyecto Contra Sida. I wrote a sexy bilingual safer sex guide for dykes and generally found other ways to turn a willingness to be publicly perverse into a marketable skill. 
The truth is, once you succumb to the hell of puta, once you've had enough rumors, ex-lovers, and naked pictures circulating in the world, the stigma stops mattering as something that can be used against you, even as you notice all the ways it sticks to your skin. My final year of graduate school, I moved to Spain's Basque region, chasing love and foreign adventure. In Spain, my accent, my aesthetic, my way of moving through the world all served as an irrefutable marker of my difference. Immigrante, sudaca, cubana, puta. During my year in Spain, I was propositioned three times for sexual labor. In fact, Cubanas are so fetishized in Europe and elsewhere that we even have a sexual act named for us. Una Cubana refers to stimulating a penis between corpulent breasts. Just saying. Moving back to San Francisco, I rented an apartment in the Tenderloin, an area popular with sex workers and their clients. And I would again be repeatedly asked, how much? In both places, here and there, I was identified by how I looked and where I wandered and where I was located in someone else's spatial mapping of a world of erotic possibilities. The truth is, I've been called puta more times than I remember. I've been called puta because of how I look and where I roam, because of who and what I desire, and because of who and what I refuse. And I have answered, cultivating an aesthetic and an attitude from the impossibility of being otherwise. Perhaps you've seen me grinding out my puta passions on a dance floor, documenting my dating life on the socials, being indecent with strangers at San Francisco's kinkiest block party or in a Berlin dark room with my bestie. More scandalous still because being sexual after the glow of youth has faded is always particularly shameful. Perhaps you recognize my face from the numerous dating apps that I turn to in the hope of getting lucky. However, most likely you've seen me lecturing on your campus, fulfilling or not your expectation of what a puta with a PhD and a government job might look and sound like. In fact, as an academic who has created a reputation for herself as a scholar of sexuality, I've been rewarded in unexpected ways for writing explicitly about my own erotic archive, even as I have no doubt been dismissed or excluded from other possibilities. These two might be understood as sex work, ways of working sex that are pleasurable, profitable, and dangerous in different ways and to different degrees. The differences matter. While this project is invested in probing the slippery boundaries that define what constitutes both sex and labor, it's also committed to challenging the moral and legal hierarchies that are assigned to those differences. Because while we might all consider, while we might consider all the ways sex can be exchanged for social status, dinner, jewelry, citizenship, or domestic security. Exchanging sex for money remains illegal. As a scholar of racialized gender and sexuality, I wanted to write a book that would pay homage to the sexual communities that formed me as a scholar and as a sexual subject. But more importantly, I wanted to make queers and all of us committed to the project of social justice and sexual freedom care about the ongoing criminalization of sex work. 
because while I have frequently been able to extract monetary value from my sexuality in a variety of ways, because I've never been economically dependent on criminalized work, I have been sheltered from a wide range of consequences. I've never had to fear being arrested for doing my job. I've never been denied employment, housing, citizenship, or state benefits for engaging in sexual labor. I've never had my bank account or social media accounts closed because I was suspected of engaging in illicit activity or had my assets seized because they were procured through illegal means. I've never been deemed legally unfit as a parent because of my work or had to worry about my adult son that he could be arrested for procurement because he benefits economically from my labor. These are some of the current realities faced by sex workers in the United States, made more pernicious and obscene through laws such as Sesta Fosta. We might all recall that in 2018, the feds shut down Backpage, a website synonymous with ads for escort services, erotic massages, and other forms of sexual labor, queer and otherwise. A few days after Backpage was shut down, Sesta Fosta became U.S. law. Its stated goal was to reduce human trafficking by amending a section of the Communications Decency Act and holding internet platforms accountable for the content of their users. We already know that whenever decency is invoked, queers are at risk. And whenever the law is called in, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color are those who are most subject to harm. What the law actually does is put increased pressure on internet platforms to censor their users, leaving those who rely on sex work as their primary form of income without many of the digital tools they had once used to screen clients, form communities, and keep themselves safe. Moreover, these bans promote dangerous forms of digital surveillance and have impacted the creative production of sexually explicit artists and performers, and numerous artists have already had their accounts blocked. Sesta Fosta accentuates the economic precarity of sex workers seeking out independently controlled income, resulting in more dangerous working conditions for all involved in the industry. The effects have, of course, been most harmful to sex workers who face multiple forms of marginalization, those racialized as black and brown, migrants and undocumented folks, trans workers, disabled workers, and all who lack access to more expensive advertising sites that might be sheltered from the impact of FOSTA. The laws, regulation, and stigma that surround commercial sex work function to discipline the sexual expression, pleasures, and possibilities of all of us. But we know that the harms they inflict are always differentially experienced, governed by proximities to power and privilege that swirl all around us. I want you to care about sex workers and to make common cause with their fight for decriminalization, well, because many queers and trans people are also sex workers or have at some point in their lives exchanged sex for money. Maybe for a minute while they were trying to make ends meet or maybe for much longer because of all the ways that transphobia, ableism, racism, and homophobia permeate employment and education sectors. As educators, we also need to recognize that a great number of the students that we teach every day are using sex work to support themselves and also risking the stigmatization and criminalization that surrounds that labor. We've already heard of too many instances of professional careers, academic and otherwise, destroyed through the surfacing of connections to sex work. 
Stigma has material consequences. Sex work is work, but unlike so many other shitty jobs out there, sex workers are not afforded even the most basic forms of legal protection. In fact, women engaged in sex work face the most dangerous, indeed murderous, occupational environment in the United States. But it's not just bad clients. Because their work is criminalized, sex workers are continually susceptible to the harassment and violence of the police. In fact, one study found that, quote, prior assault by police had the strongest correlation with client perpetrated violence against female sex workers. Criminalization allows police to stop question, extort, and violate sex workers or anyone suspected of working sex with near impunity. In many places, including New York and San Francisco, this was this law changed just recently, 2019, having more than three condoms in your possession could be used as evidence of your intent to commit sex work three condoms, that's like a good Tuesday night. If you care about the sex crimes of the state, about police brutality, the corrupt bail bond prison, uh, the bail bond business or the prison industrial complex, I want you to care about the ongoing criminalization of sex work. I want you to care because queers, kinksters, and sex workers have long been united in efforts to combat the regulatory violence of the state. Queers have long formed part of sex worker economies and the social movements to address the injustices leveled against them. Gay and trans sex workers were primary targets of the police raids that would become that would come to be known as Compton Cafeteria Riot in California and later Stonewall in New York. And even as queer icons like Sylvia Rivera, part Marsha P. Johnson, Tamara Ching, and Felicia Elizondo are frequently lauded as trans pioneers for their roles in these historic acts of resistance, their relationship to sex work remains under continual erasure. That desire to assimilate into respectability was powerfully called out by Rivera when she addressed the crowd at New York City's Christopher Street Liberation Day March in 1973. In that speech, Rivera railed against those in attendance that had forgotten their gay brothers and sisters in jail, speaking directly to the ways the emerging gay and lesbian movement was intent on ignoring the criminalization and police violence that surround sexual commerce. In a later interview conducted by another trans icon, Leslie Feinberg, uh, Rivera stated, we always felt that the police were the real enemy. I want you to care about sex workers because Silvia Rivera told you to. I want you to care about the ongoing criminalization of sex work because queers are some of the most enthusiastic consumers of all kinds of sexual labor and have long relied on our ability to negotiate the terms of our sexual and affective relationships outside the structures of monogamous marriage, skills we learned from BDSM and sex worker communities. Even in a political climate like the United States, where notions of individual freedom are canonized, entrepreneurialism is exalted, and commerce is king, sex work is never framed as an expression of corporeal autonomy, sexual freedom, or promising commercial opportunism. Today in the United States, gays and lesbians can marry. Legalized marijuana is graining, gaining traction in so many places. Kink aesthetics have gone Balenciaga, but it's still illegal. 
for me to pay some sexy and willing stud to blow out my back. That's a problem. Therefore, addressing the stigma that surrounds Buddha life is also about addressing the stigma of those willing to pay the price of someone else's sexual labor. Clients, always imagined as male, are generally portrayed as undesirables rather than as people in search of sexual attention, satisfaction, or care. What might it mean to imagine that sexual touch might be something that those of us who are female or femme can also purchase, that those poorly equipped to navigate sex in the marketplace of normative desirability might also have a right to access, that rather than waiting to be asked for sex, those of us who are unchosen in these economies of desire can also seek out, negotiate, and value for ourselves the pleasures offered by the touch of another. If we can agree that sexual labor, intimate erotic care, and those that perform it are valuable, might we allow ourselves to imagine that we too should have access to that care? If you care about disability rights, about access to sexual pleasure as we age, or about the labor rights of those who work to care for our bodies, I want you to care about sex work. I want you to care about the ongoing criminalization of sex work because the right to sell access to your body and your sexual labor is core to our rights of self-determination and bodily autonomy. An autonomy that is connected to our rights to abortion, gender affirming treatments, drug consumption, and our right to engage in consensual BDSM relationships. And we can imagine how access to abortion, right, is particularly urgent for sex workers. When we think of an issue, we need to think about how it might impact sex workers. Just as trans exclusionary feminisms have attacked the rights of trans people in order to protect real women, those same feminist factions argue that in order to protect women, we must criminalize sex work in order to ensure that none of us have the right to enter into consensual economic relationships structured around sexual labor. I just came back from Spain where the Socialist Party, the Socialist Party, was campaigning on a platform on the abolition of sex work. I was confused. This was not the abolition of work, something I would support, um, but the abolition of sex work, which by definition invokes the power of the state and police to surveil and castigate. The criminalization of sex work does not free us from capitalist exploitation or misogyny. It only makes everything bad about sex work worse. And while we might understand that our ability to consent only exists within an available horizon of possibility, to suggest that adults should not be allowed to use their own bodies for profit or consent to the extraction of their own labor jeopardizes our ability to consent to a whole range of activities that the state might deem harmful from kink to drug use. Be warned, the new wave of sexual panic travels under the sign of trafficking. Today in doctor's offices, airports, schools, and bus shelters, we're seeing posters that invite us to spot the signs that someone might be trafficked. Those signs include things like avoiding eye contact or social interaction with authority figures or law enforcement, not trusting the police, lacking official identification documents, appearing destitute or lacking personal possessions, 
or my favorite references to daddy, which they equate with street slang for pimp. Today, trafficking discourse gets marshaled to train Karens in spotting and reporting suspicious behavior to help victims and does nothing to encourage Karen to start paying her immigrant nanny a living wage. The panic that revolves around sexual trafficking foments a discourse of victimization and salvation that is always racialized and gendered. As social projects of reform, rescuing sex workers always seems more compelling than addressing the everyday harms that feminized bodies and others are subjected to domestic violence, police violence, state violence, or the everyday harms of poverty. What trafficking discourse promotes instead is citizen surveillance based on failure to conform to the normative demands of a sheltered white middle-class life. And too often it is a ruse for anti-immigrant sentiments because the number to call if you suspect someone is being trafficked, is the Department of Homeland Security, the same department responsible for deportations. Therefore, if you care about gender rights, labor rights, or immigrant rights, I want you to care about sex workers. While some of this trafficking discourse might appear quite absurd, capable of ensnaring anyone who is poor, undocumented, unhoused, or distrustful of the state, that is precisely the point, and the consequences are wholly predictable. This year, I served as an expert witness in an online sting operation designed to trap sex traffickers. The sting involved a blonde undercover agent with the screen name Snow Bunny going into online dating forums, seducing young Black men and encouraging them to travel together to sell her sexual labor. Even as the transcripts make clear that the police officer what the catfish, right, was the one initiating this fast money scheme as a willing adult female. And the exchanges were filled with verbalized instances of him asking and receiving her affirmative consent. Those transcripts were used to charge him with procurement or pimping. The 22-year-old defendant who, has, who was unemployed and who was texting Snow Bunny from the basement of his parents' house eventually tired of wasting away in jail and pled guilty to avoid additional jail time. He will now be labeled a sex offender for the rest of his young life. I'd love to speak to a journalist about this. It should surprise no one that 10 of the 11 men caught up in the sting operation were African-American. If the moment of thinking that we might be able to fuck our way into sexual freedom has passed, the current political climate should remind queer study scholars why sex still matters. Conservative efforts to limit monitor, censor, and criminalize sexual expression are codified into every aspect of public life. As activists, we need to recognize how the right to abortion, to gender-affirming health care, and the right to negotiate the terms of our sexual labor are bound together, united in refusing the authority of the state to determine what we can do with our bodies. When queer politics refuse to take up issues of the sex and its regulation, we perpetuate a discourse that locates sex within the confines of a privileged domestic sphere. That's dangerous for anyone who lives outside the social confines dictated by someone else's morality 
that we all know how racial privilege, class, and connection lessens the risks of any transgression. It's always the sexual and social cultures of the poor, the racialized, the genderqueer, the migrant, the unhoused that are made suspect. If you care about social justice, I want you to join the chorus of sex worker advocates, human rights organizations like Amnesty International, the Human Rights Watch, and the World Health Organization to support the decriminalization of sex work worldwide. Because what has been demonstrated time and time again in every country, in every context, is that laws that criminalize sex work put those involved at an increased risk for a variety of harms. Today, sex workers face a worldwide epidemic of violence and murder. Sex workers are routinely hunted and harmed by those who understand the value of their lives is deemed negligible, insufficient to warrant concern, let alone protection or justice. The stigma that conditions the violences against sex workers is the same stigma that structures the response to those violations. Whether in discussions of Asian American female victims of a mass shooting in Atlanta, the ongoing drama of missing and murdered indigenous women in Canada and the United States, the unsolved femicides in Juarez, Mexico, and throughout the global south, or the incessant murder of transgender women in the streets of every urban capital. At the moment of their death, so often the victim's relationship to puta life hovers around the circumstances of their violent ends. For some, any association to sex work becomes a way to discount the violations to which so many are routinely subjected, concluding that because they consented to sex with a stranger in exchange for money, the violence committed against them is to be expected, if not deserved. For others wishing to solicit outrage or justice, any connection a victim might have to sex work must be denied, dismissed, or deemed disrespectful because even in death, the indelible stain of sexual labor endures. Therefore, my work in this new book also harbors another meaning for puta life. As a response to puta vida, a fucking life, a life determined by condemnation, violence, and stigmatized contempt, I offer the possibility of puta life, an affirmation of the beauty, value, and spirit of putas everywhere. This book came looking for me, whispering the word puta as the word that cannot be named, to name the thing that we cannot be, to name that to which we have already been condemned. To this word, I add life, the possibility of a life that will remake the word and that will exceed the word and remake it. My wish full of utopian yearnings is that in addressing the stigma that surrounds sexual labor, we might begin to redefine sexual politics in ways that tend to the harms of police violence, state surveillance, and the censure of sexual expression. That we might quell the murderous violence of everyday misogyny and nurture the sparks of carnal courage that are everywhere pouring out into the streets to demand the right to own our own bodies, the right to live free from stigma, violence, and harm, the right to no care. Bold in its political aspirations, Tender in its queer feelings, this book is my homage to those whose lives have been marked by the regulatory power of puta life. Today, I invite you 
to join me in that effort so that we might see ourselves and each other anew. Thank you. You can tell me what to do. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for that um, amazing, moving um, talk tonight. We now have a little bit of time for Q&A. So we are going to open it up to the audience for questions. We have um, a microphone here on each side of the aisle, and we can come to you if you raise your hand and have a question. You may stay up here and answer those questions. And also, I invite those who are watching on the live stream to put your questions um, in the comments, and we will have the opportunity to read them aloud here as well. Wow. Thank you for the beautiful challenges. Um, there's one little part that I didn't hear. And if it's relevant to your point of view, I'd like you to answer it. It's about pleasure. It's about the female body or the woman body, whatever the language is best said, that enjoys sex. Yes, but what do we call it? Nymphomania. It's, it's medicalized. It's called a psychological condition. And I have known putas of different ethnic backgrounds who just love sex and found out that they could make money at it at the same time. That's about pleasure. And I would like you to talk about pleasure between people consensual that may or not be monetized and the body is not commodified because of economic conditions? Um, that's a great question. You know, um, I put together a, a pretty uh, eclectic archive for this, um, for this book. And, but where I started was with the as told to uh, memoir of Vanessa del Rio, a very famous Cuban Puerto Rican porn star uh, during the golden age of, um, of porn. And, um, you know, Vanessa, uh, the name of the book is uh, 50 Years of Slightly Slutty Behavior. And what I love about this book is it's one of those thick Tashin books, a coffee table book, and um, it's filled with, you know, pictures of, you know, these full color spreads um, and it comes with a DVD. So you're hearing her talk about her life and how much she loves sex. Um, so if you want her life, um, you have to sort of, watch the por it's the, the the parts of her talking are intercut with scenes from her porn films so if you want if you're just there for the porn you have to sit through her life and if you're just there for her life you have to sit through the porn um i don't think yeah i don't think all sex workers love their work i don't think all teachers love their work um but i i did i thought it was really important to um, profile different kinds of relationships uh, to sex work. And so I did start with pleasure um, because that's where I start. Yeah. Um, so I am, um, yeah, I love sex. It's great. And I want to keep having it for a really long time. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I don't know, yeah, sure. <laughs> That's not an offer, uh, but maybe it is, I don't know. Um... 
<laughs> that was such a beautiful talk and I just love the way you delivered it. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask you a dry question. Okay. But I'm a nerd from a method. Tell me about what's tell me about the method of the of the new book. You know, I it kind of kept changing. Um, I you know, I started with uh, Vanessa. and in that chapter, I was really trying to think of what feminist scholarship, might do with someone like Vanessa del Rio, might do with some kind of difficult pleasures um, that she describes. Um, and thinking about what, what we're able to say about ourselves, right? How, when we talk about our lives, we're always um, drawing on like, what's what's already in our minds, right? The kind of uh, horizon of possibilities, what we already know. Um, so really thinking about what that does to biography. Um, but as the as the project kept developing, I started to really think about this relationship to affect and aesthetics, in part because one of the questions, you know, I want I wanted this book to have people care about sex work. And I kept thinking, what are the affects that make people care? What are the affects that make people care about someone else's life? What are the affects that make people um, feel touched by someone else's life? Um, and so thinking about what we don't know, how do we hold what we don't know? How do we hold everything that we're not told? How do we hold the silences and the vulnerabilities that might be shared in, in a memoir, in some kind of testimonial? How do we hold those things with care um, and leave space for distrust, leave space for other kinds of feelings? So um, yeah, uh, I think, Affect and aesthetics, yeah. Okay. Hello, thank you for your talk. So lovely to see you. <laughs> it's my student, Sophie. <laughs> Um, I have kind of a personal question, I guess, because um, <laughs> I was struck by um, something that you said towards the beginning of your talk about kind of coming up during the AIDS pandemic and how that kind of compelled you to, you and your cohort, <laughs> to speak so candidly. Um, and I guess I was wondering if there's something that you miss about the scene um, and if there's something that in the kind of, you know, because you also spoke about being on the apps now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I guess I was just wondering if there's a spirit that you miss that you would like queers to kind of come back to or if you'd like to see more of it. Yeah, <laughs> there's a uh, yeah, there's a lot I miss. I mean, I think it's funny. Um, I, I remember dental dams, right? All these dykes were like using dental dams in solidarity uh, with our, our gay brothers. Um, the, you know, it was just the physicality, the being what it meant to be uh, together in person. The fact that that is so risky, the fact that touch, that intimacy, that proximity, is 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 um, feels dangerous um, that for some people it's just not possible given their own risks that's just not possible really changes how how we're able to see each other how we're able to interact um, it's really easy to swipe left and just say oh no um, there's a way in which we're not really fully giving ourselves a chance to be seduced by a look 
by the way someone moves or dance, right? It's like, what are their stats? What, you know, how old are they? What are they lit? Like, it's just kind of information um, and less about the quality of the person and what might be possible. So I miss flirting in person. I miss just the, 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 the possibility of it. Um, one of the things that I really love, I mean, I was in Berlin in this tiny little window where everyone was vaccinated. You had to show your vaccine and the negative test and everything, but then we could sort of be together. And um, without cameras, and that was important because it wasn't about doing it for the gram. It was having an experience that you could remember, maybe, <laughs> and, uh, and take home with you. Um, but it was about the kind of uh, fleshiness of those encounters. And um, I love public sex. I love wholesome. I, lo I do. I, I, those, uh, those spaces are just so exciting. Even if I'm not do, I just like the, the feel of it, the vibe of it. Um, and I worry about those spaces. I worry what it means for generations to come up with, you know, people are anxious and depressed. Um, and there are so many reasons to be anxious and depressed. I get anxious and depressed too. But those spaces were kind of um, a salve for that. Um, and so I miss them very, very much. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to jump in with a question from our live stream. And this is actually from a board member of CLAG's, Shaka McLaughlin. Ah. <laughs> who uh, asks, how do you cultivate the generosity and kindness that you express in your work and teaching? It would be so easy to go so dark. Wow. Um, well, I will start by saying I had a great mentor. Um, you know, uh, the, it's, it's really true. Uh, I get financial advice from Judith Butler, um, who uh, helped me negotiate every job offer I ever had, um, and all kinds of things. Um, so I, yeah, um, I had wonderful mentors throughout my life. So many Black women. Um, Janetta Cole, who later went on to become the president of Spell. I don't know if she remembers me, but I wrote her. It, it took me 11 years to finish my BA. And she had been at the very beginning of that journey. So 11 years later, she wrote uh, a letter of recommendation for me that was so, I'm sure it was so important for me just just starting so I have been the recipient of so much generosity um that it's just about paying it forward yeah and it does bring the good karma it it really does I love my students yeah and they're all going to visit me in, in their retirement home. I, I swear to God, please come. Yes, yes. <laughs> this is a wonderful uh, presentation. And, you know, it took me a long time to have desire and, and sex come together. Mm. And you know what I really miss? I miss those places you're talking about. It really made me whole. I actually have won a Joan Mitchell Award for painting those journeys. Mm -hmm. And the thing, and the thing is, one of the things that I really this is not a question, but one of the things you really think that mostly what I really began to feel about is the women in Iran. Yes. Well, you know, this is an issue of all throughout society in terms of desire and power. And what people, what, and what you've done is you've empowered yourself through experiences that we all share in a certain way. But how, but every time I would at, go to those places, before I would go, I have huge anxiety. And afterwards, I always say, why didn't I go sooner? <laughs> why didn't I run there? And, and I'm the most happy and sexual now, and I'm 78. It took a long journey. 
sex is fun. Yes. Thank you. I, I, yes. um, I so uh, was so moved by Samuel Delaney's piece. I think it was in the New Yorker talking about uh, he belongs to a community of, of older queer men and they're throwing uh, play parties for men in their 80s. Um, and so that's how I want to spend my 80th birthday. Um, yeah. <laughs> I wanna. I wanna. Over here. Oh yes, <laughs> if the light is very. Young. Over here. I wanna. So good to see you, it's Eng Bing. Oh. Uh, um, congratulations on the award and what a beautiful talk. Um, I wanted to ask you about the role of the confessional gossip and biography in Puta life and really to think through um, Nicole's earlier question about method perhaps um, the provision of sex acts and the way that you think through and insist on um, sex um, is that a way for you to, to um, think about some of the critiques in queer theorizing, which have in some ways in, in recent years become increasingly desexualized or have avoided the um, engagement of sex um, in the thinking of uh, world making and so forth. Yeah, um, I think, um... Yeah, I think particularly in, you know, sexual futures, I was really trying to really sort of wrestling with that, like this sort of, you know, there are so many things, I get it, there are so many things to care about in the world. Um, and there was this way in which queers, uh, you know, sex is trivial, it's about pleasure, it's about, you know, it's this personal thing, but it's not. It's about, you know, the fact that in prison, one of the things, one of the punishments for being in prison is that the only people that touch you are the guards, <laughs> um, right? The only kind of human contact is to be violated by the state. Um, anything else is sort of prohibited. So if we cannot think of sex as private, uh, it's not. It's only private for those people that have the comfort and the privilege of privacy. And so um, I think as queers, we need to understand all the ways that sex touches the, you know, the dirty surfaces of public life. And whether that's um, thinking about uh, prisons, whether it's thinking about um, you know, uh, laws around sex work, whether it's thinking about other kinds of public policy that that literally uh, form the architecture of our lives. Uh, I think sex is core to so many issues. It's about immigration. It's about, you know, how many families can you have, right? Um, and so, you know, we think of things um, like polyamory or bisexuality, and you know, it's it's cool when rich and famous people do it, but it's just perverse um, when uh, poor people do it, right? When you have a family in Mexico and one in the United States, when you have uh, multiple partners, um, right? So those kinds of issues, I think. Queers need to step into the space of um, of the public. Uh, I was I love I love Nicole's work so much, and in in some ways it really inspired me to think about what how can the humanities speak to public policy if the hum, part of the humanities is about the, the hearts and minds, what can we do to have people think differently about something like the criminalization of sex? Um, it really is amazing to me that sex work is still illegal, that me giving, you know, 
$20 is still illegal. But we know who gets trapped in that. And so, like so many other things, um, privilege shelters you. And so if queers think that, you know, their sex is uh, trivial and unimportant, it's because their sex is privileged and protected. But for many, many people, it is not. And so I really want to put that challenge to queer studies to take sex seriously in all of these forms. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for coming, dear. Juana. Yes. Yes. Okay. Hi, how are you doing? Um, I loved your talk. I love your work. Um, and I have, I always feel, uh, you know, that it's, uh, it's so uh, joyful, expansive, that you're able to deal, that you're able to almost say anything and be able to deal with very hard subjects uh, that somehow in your narration, in the way that you tell things, uh, you allow us to deal with very difficult stuff. And so I was wondering in this book, um, if you encountered like, um, you know, areas that were very risky uh, um, where you're uh, dealing with um, uh, with someone else's life, uh, where you uh, where you in a sense are putting a camera on someone, uh, and therefore uh, there are areas of uh, you might be uh, making that person more vulnerable. Um, how did you deal with material that seemed very hard to deal with personally? but also that you did not want uh, that, you know, that you wanted uh, people to approach in a manner that was uh, respectful or uh, engaging in, 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 a, in a reflection. That is really a fabulous question. I, let me say a couple of things about that. Um, I'll begin by saying that I, even though I was writing about sex workers, I was, um, I did not do any interviews. Um, I was looking at the representation that already existed. Uh, books of photography, and uh, I look at a graphic novel, um, documentary films that had already been produced by others. And so others that had secured permissions that I might not have access to. I also looked at some archival material. Um, representation in all of its forms is always dangerous. Um, we can never speak for another. And so um, it was, um, it's always a challenge. Um, and so I really thought about that uh, a lot. Um, and part of what I sort of came to is that, you know, representation is hard, but it's still necessary. We still need to hear stories. We, I still believe that stories do things in the world. I still believe that they change people's, um, I, minds and hearts. And so it is that question of how you, um, you know, kind of at some points I felt I was in between Sadia Hartman's uh, critical fabulation and Glissant's right to opacity, right? How do you represent without repeating uh, other violences? How do you represent in a way that leaves room for what you don't know? How do you represent in a way that puts your own vulnerability um, at the center? And so part of what I, I try to do in, in, in this book is really think about my own relationship to um, to put a life, my own relationship to aging, to sex, um, to the the 
the stories that I was hearing and asking, thinking about vulnerability. I think somewhere else I've, I've talked about a kind of femme methodology, right? What it means to be open, what it means to be filled up with someone else's feelings. And um, yeah, so for this book, I, I, I felt it was important um, to tell these stories um, and to use them to, to move the dial on sex work, really. Um, so there is a, a, a kind of clear political agenda there. Um, but, but I think that's always the question. I think I will say one of the things that I take great comfort in is that I am not fully capable of representing myself. That even if we have um, people talking about themselves, there's always this kind of uh, an absence. You're never fully getting everything. And there's also this excess. You're always reading more into the stories than what was actually there. And so for me, representation is kind of navigating between the sort of absence, abscess, absence of what we don't know and this excess of the kind of feelings that that a work might inspire that a photograph might inspire um so yeah i think that's kind of the closest to sort of thinking about methodology yeah thank you what? <laughs> Thanks to all of you for your questions. And um, I'd like to invite James and Justin onto the stage so we can present you with your Kessler Award. Thank you. <laughs> it feels so right. It feels so right. This Thank is just... you. That's so good. It feels so right. So let's have another Thank round of applause. Um, you know, they told me that I was supposed to say uh, concluding remarks. I have no concluding remarks. I am so just overwhelmed and humbled and honored and uh, delighted um, and, yeah, uh, grateful for, for the honor. Thank you all so much. And thank you all again for coming this evening. And for those of you out there um, and joining us uh, virtually as well, um, this has been a true pleasure and honor um, and a wonderful reconnecting in our space for the first time after uh, since the pandemic. Um, so with that, uh, thank you all again. Uh, please join us in, um, in the uh, atrium outside. Um, for a light um, meet and greet and refreshments. Um, and thank you all again. Yeah, I think all women will come to the Yes. I'm sorry, we need to work for Oh my God. <laughs> yes. Um,
I hope that the recording is good. <laughs> <laughs> the, I'm really 